Well, uh, good morning. If you have uh, a Bible, I invite you to turn to the Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark, uh, where we are going to be looking at um, the Mark chapter 13 this morning, uh, part 2 of, uh, uh, I guess, three-part series on uh, Mark 13. Uh, recently, I've been listening to a, a podcast by Pastor Timothy Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City on trusting God in difficult times. Uh, and in one of the episodes, his wife, uh, Kathy, gives the following illustration. Uh, if you were driving in the dark in a place you didn't know, what would you rather have with you? The best army topological map showing every rock and bump and tree, or a local resident sitting in the seat next to you? Would you rather have a map that shows you the whole picture, but you better interpret it right to get where you you, you need to go, or a local who can show you where to go and which turns to make and, and how to get back to the highway? I know which one I would rather have in that moment. Um, I'm sure we all would. Uh, But if we were to apply this to the Christian life, there are times when I want the map more than I want the map maker in the vehicle with me. You know, instead of trusting in God, I often want to see the whole picture so that I can know what's going to happen to me in the next, next few years. And for many of us, this is how we approach the study of the end times. Instead of trusting in God, we often want to to know what is going to happen. We want the big picture of when things are going to happen and how it's going to happen and where it's going to happen and all that stuff. But what we need when we are embarking in territory that is foreign to us, when we're stumbling around in the dark, is not a map, but rather we need the map maker. We don't need the whole picture. We need God himself. And the good news is that God gets into the vehicle with us in the person of Jesus Christ, and he shows us where we need to go. And he doesn't give us the whole picture. He doesn't give us everything all at once, thankfully. (laughs) But he has revealed to us what we need to know in the present. And the fact that we have God in the vehicle with us means that we will never get lost if we trust in him. And this is important when we come to a difficult passage of Scripture like Mark chapter 13, because we tend to in- interpret uh, this passage in one of two ways, which I mentioned last week. We, we either take this passage out of its original context and interpret it through uh, the lens of what we are going through today, or we leave this passage in its original context and don't consider any future implications for us today. And what we discovered last week is that Jesus is speaking to the immediate context of his disciples in preparing them for the destruction of the Jerusalem temple that was coming in AD 70. But Jesus is also looking ahead to the events surrounding his second coming. In other words, the the destruction of the temple is the lens through which we are to view the return of the Lord. Instead of giving us the whole picture, Jesus is wanting us to be on guard and to watch for the return of the Lord. You, you find uh, those phrases throughout uh, this chapter. Instead of allowing the study of the end times to become a point of contention among us, which is easy, easy for that to do, Jesus is wanting us to find agreement in, in the truth that Christ is risen, that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and that he is coming again to gather his people. On that, we can agree, and uh, with that as our basis, uh, let us begin by reading uh, all of Mark chapter 13 uh, so that we can get the context, and then we will dive in. Uh, Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. And as he, Jesus, came out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? 
There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be, will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And, when he will send out, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know what time, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Uh, Last week, uh, we looked at the first uh, 13 verses of Mark chapter 13. Uh, This morning, we're going to look at Uh, verses 14 to uh, 27. But last week we looked at uh, how persecution was coming for the disciples of Jesus as they would suffer for the sake of Christ and the gospel and how we find 
uh, that this has continued to this day with the persecution of uh, followers of Jesus all around the world. And the good news of Jesus, I'm sure you saw when I read it or heard it when I read it there, um, the good news of Jesus is that the one who endures to the end will be saved. And, and that's, that's the promise that we can hold on to. But then in verse 14, Jesus introduces us to a specific kind of persecution and the uh, abomination of desolation. Uh, the phrase that Jesus uses here is taken from uh, three references in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations, note that word, shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 says, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. And then Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 says, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Uh, so what is the abomination of desolation? And what relevance do Jesus' words have for us today? Well, there's a sense in which uh, the abomination of desolation was already fulfilled uh, around 167, 168 BC. Uh, at that time, the Seleucid king by the name of uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes slaughtered 40,000 Jews and plundered the Jewish temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of burnt offering, sprinkled broth uh, from the unclean flesh all over the holy grounds as a deliberate act of defilement, and then erected an image of Zeus above the altar. Now, if you know anything about <coughs> Jewish culture or, uh, or Judaism, then you know that this would have been a sacrilege of indescribable proportions. Uh, it, it was actually this incident that sparked the Maccabean revolt uh, in which the Jewish people rebelled against the Syrians and won, securing uh, the only period of autonomy they had uh, from the time of King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC to the formation of the state of Israel in 1948. Just, just a brief period of autonomy that they had there. Uh, no doubt the disciples of Jesus and the readers of Mark's gospel uh, would have had this incident in the back of their minds as Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation, truly uh, an abomination of uh, indescribable pr proportions. But Jesus seems to have a uh, near future fulfillment in mind. Uh, given that Jesus is still addressing the question of his disciples uh, about when the destruction of the temple would be accomplished, uh, there is a sense in which the abomination of desolation would take place in some sense uh, in, in A.D. 70. Uh, Luke, in his gospel account, uh, gives us some insight into what the abomination of desolation meant for the people of Jesus' day. Because again, we're, we're uh, looking at the, the context of, uh, of Jesus' words in accordance with you know, what they were going through. Uh, and in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, Luke records Jesus saying, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. So Luke doesn't actually use the phrase abomination of desolation, but he does refer to uh, desolation of some kind. And what Jesus is referring to uh, is what would eventually take place in A.D. 70 and in the years leading up to A.D. 70. Uh, when the Roman general Titus would converge on Jerusalem and the temple uh, with the Roman army. They would surround uh, Jerusalem and, uh, and converge on them in that year. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 15 helps us further by identifying the abomination of desolation as standing in the holy place. In Mark chapter 13, verse 14, 
Uh, Mark notes the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. Uh, Gentiles could only go as far as uh, the court of the Gentiles in the temple. We uh, looked at that uh, a few weeks ago when, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. But General Titus uh, would stand where he ought not to be in the holy place where only the high priest was allowed to enter. Uh, and this would be a sign to all those in Judea to flee to the mountains for Jesus' prophecy that there will uh, not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. His prophecy would soon be fulfilled. Uh, this would require everyone to act urgently. That's why Jesus says, let the one who is uh, on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. So all all of this uh, would have taken place to some extent in A.D. 70. The appearance of the abomination of desolation in the temple would be a sign to them that intense persecution, as it not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, was soon to come upon them. Uh, we, know that, uh, we, we know from historical records from that day uh, that this was the case for those in Jerusalem. One commentator writes, uh, never so high a percentage of one city's population was destroyed. Everyone was either killed or sold into slavery. Approximations are that 1,100,000 people were killed and 100,000 were enslaved. And, and that, that seems absolutely horrible, uh, a persecution we, we can't even imagine in such a short period of time. But however horrible the persecution was in, in the days of 167 BC and, and even AD 70, these events anticipate a final climactic event of horrible desolation, destruction to come in those days just before the second coming of Christ. Remember, Jesus is addressing the immediate context of his disciples but he's also looking ahead. He's looking forward to a future time of destruction to a greater degree. If we can even imagine that, if we, we can even comprehend a destruction of greater degree than that of the destruction of the temple, that was coming. That is still to come. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction, very important words there, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. The, the abomination of desolation alludes to uh, the destruction of the temple in AD 70, but finds its future fulfillment in those days when, when a blasphemous uh, antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, will exalt himself as God and unleash uh, truly such a tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be as Mark 13, 19 says, which will usher in the return of the Lord. Uh, we, we, are to, uh, we are to think of this, what Jesus is uh, saying here, uh, as a, a near fulfillment and a future fulfillment. We are to view this as, uh, I guess, the, the preview of a movie. Uh, I, I love movies, so I have no problem uh, using this illustration. Uh, we, we have a lot of old uh, Disney movies on VHS. Uh, yes, we, we have a VCR that plays VHS movies. Uh, so our, our family has been watching uh, more movies in the evenings these days. Uh, but it was funny to watch one a, a, a little while ago uh, where there was a, a preview for a, a new Disney movie that was coming out soon, that was coming soon to, to theaters called The Lion King. Right, and I, I laughed because The Lion King was one of the movies that I, I grew up with, and it's hard for me to imagine that it was uh, at one time coming soon to theaters. 
But the, the preview gives us a taste of what is to come when we actually watch the movie. It's, it's not the movie itself, but it's giving us a, a taste. It's giving us a glimpse of what we can expect when we watch the movie. And sometimes we watch uh, so many previews that, uh, that we forget even what, uh, what movie we were planning on watching. But that's besides the point. In the same way, the destruction of the temple is a preview of what is to come when the man of lawlessness from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 will be revealed. We, we can know that great desolation and tribulation is coming, uh, unlike any that the world has ever seen because of what we know has already taken place back in AD 70. And, and we think to ourselves, what, what great desolation, what great persecution, what great tribulation, who will survive? Well, in verse 20, Jesus says, and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. Right, so if it weren't for the grace of God in putting a limitation on the tribulation, no one would survive. But, Jesus goes on to say, for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. He shortened the days. Uh, Jesus seems to be working off of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where the prophet Daniel says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as has never, uh, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Sorry. Uh, but at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. It sounds very similar to what um, Mark records Jesus saying here. And so church, that's, this is good news. Ultimately, this is good news. And why this is good news is because of what Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have said these things to you that uh, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus is essentially guaranteeing us tribulation, which is fun. But again, uh, Romans 8.35 is another important text for us to remember uh, as we um, work our way through Mark 13. Uh, Romans 8 verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? I mean, that's pretty, pretty all-encompassing, right? Shall, shall uh, any of these separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 37, he answers his own question, the Apostle Paul. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so regardless of what the future looks like, however bleak things may seem, the fact that there's a, a future tribulation, a future persecution that is coming on, uh, coming on God's people, we have the assurance that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can touch us apart from the will of God for his elect because Christ has overcome the world. That's, that's good news, church. That's good news. It means that nothing happens to followers of Jesus that has not per first passed through the hands of Almighty God. Uh, this, this is the best place for us to be, ultimately, because if God takes us home to glory, wh however that might be, e even if it is during this, this uh, time of great tribulation, it's because it was his will to do so, and not the will of the devil, not the will of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the, the son of destruction, the abomination of desolation, or, or even the, the will of anyone who would desire evil against us. It is God who sovereignly reveals this man of lawlessness, and it's God who cuts short the days of his tribulation. There is nothing that can be done, get this, there's nothing that can be done to God's elect apart from God's own choosing. Right? God is in sovereign control of what happens to his people. Therefore, therefore, we must not let tribulation or persecution or trials distract us from the return of the Lord. We, we must not let tribulation or persecution or trials distract us from the return of 
Christ. As we saw last week, these things are, are the beginning of the birth pains. They will only increase in frequency and intensity as we get closer to his return. But we can be assured that God will intervene in some measure of grace on the part of his elect. We, we don't know what that will look like. But it means that God has us in the palm of his hand. And church, that is a great place for us to be. That is a great place for us to be. And if uh, persecution or tribulation uh, isn't enough to deter God's elect, um, maybe uh, false prophets and false Christs will. Uh, Jesus continues in verse 21, If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. All right, so it's, it's interesting to note that throughout Mark's gospel, the true Christ, the true Messiah, is reluctant to do signs and wonders because he wants uh, people to come to him by faith and not because of what he can do for them. But here we see that there will be many who will succeed at performing signs and wonders in order that uh, they might lead astray God's elect. But praise God, they will not succeed. Right? Just like, um, just like persecution, And tribulation will not uh, lead astray God's elect, neither will false Christs and false prophets lead away God's elect. Listen, we we will not miss the return of Christ. That's what we we can be certain of. Don't, Don't be fooled into thinking that Jesus has already come, that he's just kicking around uh, somewhere in the Middle East because there are two distinct ways in which we will know that Christ has returned. Two distinct ways in which we will know that Christ has returned. Number one, we will see it. Number one, we will see it. Verse 24, Jesus says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. I'm pretty sure we'll notice all of these things taking place. Uh, At the crucifixion of Jesus in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, it says that for three hours, there was darkness over the whole land. Right? You notice that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about here, but on a more cosmic, uh, apocalyptic scale. This isn't just localized darkness. These aren't localized events. This is cosmic, apocalyptic scale of uh, heavenly bodies. Uh, It's similar to what the prophet Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with uh, wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it, from the stars of the heavens and their constellations for the stars in the heaven of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. Uh, so there, there will be no mistaking the return of Christ. The whole earth will see him return. Jesus himself says, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. We'll, we'll see him come. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascended to heaven, two angels appeared to the disciples saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, Jesus left physically and, and visibly and he will return both physically and visibly. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, here's one more, says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So first of all, we will see it. It's, it's going to be an event like anything the world has ever seen. Secondly, 
we will hear it. Secondly, we will hear it. Jesus continues, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse 31, uh, says that he will send out his angels, same, same context here, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Uh, the Apostle Paul fleshes this out for us in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. He writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Three distinct uh, sounds there. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Again, the prophet Isaiah uh, prophesied about this hundreds of years, even before Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 18, verse 3, all you inhabitants of the world, you who dwell on the earth, when a signal is raised on the mountains, look. When a trumpet is blown, hear. All right, so this is not a quiet event. The, the whole earth will hear and see the coming of the Lord. We will not miss it. Don't, don't think that you're going to miss it if you are a follower of Jesus. Instead, we have the hope from Jesus and the rest of Scripture that Christ is coming to gather his people, those whom he chose. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 27 says that Jesus will send out the angels to gather his elect. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, I already uh, referenced this. It says that we will always be with the Lord. The, uh, the kingdom of God that Christ began on the earth when he first came, right? When he said, uh, I, uh, when he said at the beginning of uh, Mark chapter 1, the kingdom of God is near or at hand, this, this kingdom of God that Christ began on the earth when he first came will be fully consummated on the earth when he comes again to make all things new. That's, that's the great hope of the church. In our broken and fallen world, we can expect to face tribulation. And we can expect uh, others to try and lead us astray. But we can stand firm in the assurance that Christ is coming again with great power and glory to gather his people. And, and it's why Jesus says in, in verse 23, but be on guard. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. I've told you all things beforehand. Now, has Jesus given us all the answers for, for everything that is to come? No, he hasn't. In fact, uh, Jesus doesn't mention a number of things. He doesn't mention uh, anything about the millennium or the new Jerusalem or the battle of Armageddon or anything like that. All, all of these things that, that normally come with the study of the end times, Jesus doesn't mention. But he has given us everything we need to know to get to where we're going. He, ha he hasn't given us the whole picture. He hasn't given us everything, everything all at once, but he has given us the directions to find our way home. He he's given us everything we need to find our way home. And, and that's, that's the point. This, this study of the things that have been and the things that are still to come is, is not intended to give us the whole picture, but is intended to get us trusting in God who, who is in the vehicle with us, which is far greater than, than having the whole picture in front of us anyway. This study of things past and future is intended to, to change the way we live in the present. It's intended to change the way we, we live today. So what are, what are some ways in which this, this affects the way we live now? Well, number one, we are to be a people uh, as Titus chapter 2, verse 13 says, who are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So number one, we're, we're awaiting people. 
Number two, we are to be a people, as uh, Revelation 22 verse 20 says, who are praying. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? So, so we're, we're to be a waiting people and a praying people. And then uh, thirdly, we are to be a people proclaiming the gospel to all nations so that as uh, Revelation 7 verses 9 and 10 says, uh, there will be a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Right, so we, we are to be a, a proclaiming people. We're to be a waiting people, a praying people, and a proclaiming people. We, we have a message, a gospel to proclaim what is this gospel? What is this good news that we proclaim to all people everywhere? It's that God created all things good. But that sin entered the world through the disobedience of the first man and first woman. And therefore death through sin. So that every human being rightly stands condemned before holy God on account of their sin. Every one of us, we all fall short. But God, being rich in mercy, sent his one and only son into the world to take our place of condemnation so that God's right justice would be satisfied in the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Three days later, God would raise this Jesus from the dead in victory over sin and death. His, His payment for sin was enough so that anyone who trusts in the completed work of Christ alone will be saved from the judgment to come. And when Christ returns, he will fully and finally restore all things, destroying every rule and power and authority, and he will reign on the earth as king and lord over all, and we will reign with him forever. This is the good news of Jesus Christ that we proclaim, and that we believe. Do you believe it? Do you believe this good news? I pray you do. I pray you do. There there is time now to turn away from your sin and turn to God, but there is coming a day when there will be no more time. When there will be no more time. The, The judgment of God is coming upon all the earth on account of our sin. And on that day, there will be no time to flee to the mountains or grab our cloak or run down to grab something in our house. There will be no more time for that. There will be no more time to repent. Unless we have put our faith in Christ, unless we have trusted in Jesus, we will not survive. We will not survive that great day. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He has made the way of salvation possible through Christ, our suffering Savior and conquering King. As we sang earlier uh, in... uh, In one of our songs, mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. When Christ returns, get this, when Christ returns, all that is wrong will be made right. All that is wrong will be made right. All our sorrows will be turned to joy. All our tribulation will be turned to peace as we rest in the finished work of Christ alone. Again, as we sang earlier, 
When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Is Christ the solid rock upon which we stand? Because see, Jesus will come again to gather his people to reign over all the earth. We, we know this is coming. The question is, will you be found among them? Will you be found among them? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. You've given us everything we need to know pertaining to matters of faith and godliness. We've been made uh, aware uh, once again of how greatly we need Jesus, how greatly we fall short, and how great a salvation you have worked in Christ. How great is your mercy and your forgiveness. We are learning these all once more. And we need to learn these daily. In the face of tribulation, God, preserve us by your grace that we may endure to the end. In the face of false Christs and false prophets and those who, would, who desire to lead us astray, uh, give us wisdom and guidance by your Holy Spirit. Make us an expectant people, God, who long for Jesus to return. And make us an urgent people, God who long for those around us to also be gathered together with Christ on that day when he returns. God, may you make us a praying people, a waiting people, and a proclaiming people that our hope might be uh, not in what this world can offer us, but ultimately in the, uh, the hope that you have for all those whom you have chosen. May our prayer, God, be even so, come, Lord Jesus, in this time and in, in times in the future, may this be our prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.